Hey everybody, Chuck and Stacy here with VO Buzz Weekly. And Stacy, what's happening today? Well, have you ever heard of X Men? Yes. X Men Two. Yes. Watchmen. Yes. Well, the screenwriter of those movies is here. And how about Metal Gear Solid? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, David Hayter, he is here. I'm oh so my excited. God, it's going to be a great show. Hey, thanks you guys for subscribing. If you haven't done that yet, please do it now. And let's get buzz. Turn it up. Get ready. You're tuned in to VO Buzz Weekly. Weekly. And now, prepare to get seriously buzzed with your hosts, Chuck Duran and Stacy J. Aswan. Okay, you guys, our guest is a versatile actor, director, and writer. He is the screenwriter of X-Men, X-Men 2, and Watchmen, the director of the action horror film Wolves, and you loved him, loved him in Metal Gear Solid. Yep. We are so excited to get buzzed with a totally awesome David Hayter. Well, thank you for having me. It's a delight to <laughs> be here. Player. It's pretty Absolutely, awesome. Absolutely, man. It's very cool. So Thanks David didn't you. know he was oh, going to be filmed yeah. today. He thought this no. was going to be a Skype patch like, huh? session or something. Yeah, I didn't know 45 minutes ago that I was going to be filmed. Yes. I, I, I just found out. I, I thought I'd sit up on my couch. Uh, and then and just do the Skype and uh, yeah. but then I was told that no pants were required and um, and and that I should actually put myself together. <laughs> so well, you clean I, up lucky, great. Yeah, exactly. Lucky for you, 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 you just happen to look good. <laughs> Fortunately, <laughs> well, I was at I was pitching a, a movie today at uh, uh, at DC that uh, is very intriguing and I can't talk about. But nice. um, but fortunately, it meant that I was somewhat spiffed up to begin with. That's so. cool, man. Yeah. Big deal. Well, we are wow. Let's talk about that. that. No, I'm just kidding. no. I can't. I know. I know. Yeah, I know. all the writing know. stuff is all secret until it comes Absolutely. out. Absolutely. Well, listen, man. Let's go back to to when you were a, t a tiny little baby. <laughs> yes. Right? We're going to take Please. you way back. Please. Um, so, um, so, so you you wanted to be an actor since you were a child, right? Yeah, I uh, started when I was nine. Um, nine years old. That's when you knew yeah. it's like this is what I want to do. Wasn't right then. It was I had auditioned for this um, kids production of Pinocchio in in Costa Mesa, uh, and then after our first show, I went backstage. I was in my costume. I sort of had the costume half off, and this young girl, this beautiful young girl. She was probably ten. I was nine. <laughs> a beautiful, oh. very young girl. <laughs> came up and asked me for my autograph. She was like, "You're so good. And can I have your uh. autograph?" And I was like, "Yeah." And then I was like. This, yeah, this could work as a as yeah. a career. I had wanted to be a lawyer up till then, and and then, then I thought, you know, I could just act like a lawyer. And exactly, you could play one on television, and not no one asks for your autograph when you're a lawyer. No, no, very very rarely. Yeah. You do probably um, sign a lot of documents. <laughs> You probably but. sign a lot of documents. Well, and plus, I had an, I, I would have had another 15, 16 years of school ahead of me, so yeah. it wasn't, that yeah. wasn't happening. Um, but yeah, that was pretty much the moment where I said, "Cool, uh, man." This, and then, how did things transpire from there? Well, I, I started producing um, plays in high school, uh, and then when I was sixteen, we moved to Japan, and I started working. <clears throat> I started doing English language voice tapes. Uh, commercials and um, and some modeling uh, there, as you do if you're a relatively well put together white <laughs> kid, <laughs> you know. So uh, that's hysterical. So that's how it started. And um, actually, uh, I, uh, no, actually, I did a. Have you interviewed Cree Summer? Not yet. So Cree Summer, um, my parents let me start auditioning in Toronto when I was 15, and I the first thing I auditioned for I got, which is this. Awesome. Um, yeah, I thought, oh, this is easy, you know. Um, it was a it was a taquitos chip commercial, and uh, and Cree Summer was in it, and How she was already cool. a working actress. Yeah. She was like, you yeah. know, 16, 17 or yeah. something. And, That's cool. And man. then uh, yeah, and so it was kind of cool to run into her down here again. That's so cool. Yeah, she's amazing. We want to have her on the show. She'll, yeah, she's we'll awesome. get her here. We'll get Absolutely. her. Absolutely. Um, so. You, when you came back to LA, did you have a goal, a plan? Like, did you say I want to do film? I want to do television? What was your? Yeah, I, uh, well, my plan. I had gone to theater school in Toronto for a year, and then uh, I said, you know, to hell with that. I'm going to Hollywood, and I was lucky enough to have been born here in California, mm -hmm. so I was a dual citizen. Uh, and I came out to to be a movie star was my intention. I wanted to be Tom Cruise or something, and yeah. and um, and uh, so that was my plan. And it started with me 
uh, working as a bar back and cleaning out the toilets at a, a club down uh, in Studio City. Well, so. that's a natural transition. Um, it's, it's certainly... I think Tom Cruise much. did that, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. I, I doubt it. I think he just hit and was, <laughs> was huge instantly, but uh, it took me a while. Yeah, so you paid yeah. your dues. Uh, so what would you consider uh, your break in voiceover in the U.S.? What was like that gig that you went, ooh, okay, this is happening? Uh, well... I, in 93, I did an episode of Major Dad, and uh, I was a Russian character, and I speak like this, I have a Russian accent. And, um, and Gordon Hunt, who was a big uh, VO director, who's just recently passed away, yeah. was in the audience, and he hired me to play a Russian on Captain Planet. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. And so uh, I was the Russian planeteer's brother. And so they brought me in, and I did a couple of episodes, and it was awesome, and, uh, you know, Mark Hamill happened to be hanging out in the lobby, and mm -hmm. uh, John Reese Davies and uh, was there, and um, and uh, you know I thought that's that's pretty cool, and and that's how it started. I, that wasn't my big break. I mean, I guess Metal Gear would have been my big mm -hmm. my big break, mm -hmm. um, but but after Captain Planet, I I started working fairly steadily, and yeah. you know that's made cool. my way. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very cool. How did you get uh, the Metal Gear stuff? How, did, was, did you audition for it? Or? Yeah, I auditioned for it. Um, the casting director for Captain Planet was yeah. Chris Zimmerman, who ended up uh, directing course, yeah. all of the English language. Beautiful. Um, you know, every, every English language uh, scene for every Metal Gear game there ever was. And, uh, and so there's an argument between her and Jennifer Hale as to who suggested bringing me in. <laughs> To audition for Snake, but um, but in any case, one of them did. Jennifer's and, pretty convincing. Yeah, she is. Well, you don't. Well, <laughs> don't mess with Jennifer. You Hale. don't want to be in between the two of those women arguing <laughs> yeah, right? about it either, because it's uh, they're both they're both pretty they're pretty strong personalities. Yes. And, yes. and uh, uh, but uh, yeah, I just went in. I just read for it, and mm -hmm. and they gave it to me. I, yeah. I didn't really know we'd be talking about it 20 years later. It was later basically and just one read in. Dude, and then, I mean, bam, people you got are it. discovering it. Yeah. I mean, people are you know it, what that's what's so cool. I mean. You're working it so stellar. Oh, thank you. And um, you're such a huge part of that franchise. Thank you. Um, and, you know, I think what's cool about it is that different generations discover it and people go back to it. I mean, it's timeless and it's cool. You know, it's so neat to have that as part of your voiceover legacy. It's pretty amazing. Uh, you know, all of the games are amazing and, and uh, you know, beyond my work in it, they're just, each one is so yeah. spectacular and yeah. so... So unique to itself, yeah. and, and yeah. yeah, it's like a, it's like a great series of novels or yeah. something. And, and, and the work you know. that goes into these things, man, oh, I mean, it's, it's astounding. Like so deep, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and how long were you uh, were you doing that for? Oh. Uh, Metal Gear. Yeah. Metal Gear. Because that's a, that's a that's a big giant franchise been around for. Yeah, I did. I started in '98. Um, and then I did nine games over the next 12 years or so. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. That's it's cool, man. It's a good man. long time. It was a great, it was a great yeah. run, you know. Yeah, it was yeah, a yeah. nice. Uh, yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah, and so for, especially for a, sort of a one-off audition that I never really expected and mm -hmm. to totally, go anywhere. Yeah. I mean, it was, it, it, it really, I mean, you know, beyond the writing, yeah. you know, I was fortunate enough to have a big break on the writing side as well and be able to do those things, but I'm so much better known for Snake and, yeah. you know, I've got fans all over the world. It's, of course. it's very, yeah. very cool. Yeah. yeah. So check it out, man. There's a lot of guys and gals out there that really, really want to break into the video game industry. Well, and that's because it's the greatest job in the world? Is that Pro well, mm. probably because it's one of the greatest True jobs in the world. story there. But the thing is, is that and I know this from experience, a lot of them don't really know what it entails to be a professional video game voice actor in an actual big video game. So tell us, since you've been there for such a long time, what does it entail? Like a regular session day, you're going in, how long are you working for? Does your, do you lose your voice sometimes? What happens? Sure. Yeah, um, it, it, you know, it depends on the game. Uh, it, a lot of games are, you know, if it's a fighting game or something like that, you might just do kicking noises, punching noises, and you know, do do a few call out lines and some impact sounds, and yeah. and that's it. But um, for that's the easy side. That's the very easy side, and those and those jobs are obviously great. Although they're you know they it's one day and you're out. Right. Um, tough to make a living off of that. Now, Snake, for example, when we did the first game, took us about ten days 
and this, or maybe it was about a week, seven days. And the final game I did, uh, Metal Gear 4, took us nine months. Mm. Wow. So, and, and that would be four hours a day, you know, a four hour session in a day. And then. Um, How many it, days a week? Well, probably three or four days a week. Okay. Um, you know, there would be days off uh, yeah. uh, here and there, and they and they do try not to not to strain your voice, but um, but it's a lot. And and you know, but but that particular job was the greatest job in the world because I would just sit there and they just bring in amazing actor after amazing actor. Because right. I always asked um, if we could do the scenes together. You know, a Which lot is of times. Awesome, because you don't normally get to do that. No, a lot of times you don't. Um, so when I do Star Wars: The Old Republic, for example, those lines are all there's branching lines. There's all these things, and you just have to do them individually, and as if you were talking to somebody, but you're not. And it's mm -hmm. like, you know, I can't believe you'd say something <laughs> like that. You know, and it's like they didn't say anything. Um, <laughs> so that requires some some yes. acting, but. Um, but on Metal Gear, you know, they bring in Christopher Randolph or Jennifer Hale or, you know, Phil Lamar or, you know, these amazing people. And you just do a few hours with them, you know, doing scenes and yeah, knocking yeah. back and forth. And, um, and it's really fun. And, um, and yeah, it can be uh, grueling. I never really lost my voice. Um, I, I, there's a story. Uh, I, I threw up on the mic once. For, um, literally? Yeah, literally, because I, they were doing, they save all the all the action and impact sounds right, for me for right. the end of the game. And, yeah. um, so, because that really does sort of kill your voice. And Snake, uh, in Metal Gear 3, you'd spin him around and around and then you'd come out of the, the <laughs> patch up screen and he'd throw up, so yeah. I had to make throw up sounds. So I was like <laughs> And you know, typically I go in after lunch because I write in the morning. So that uh, oh went God. terribly, Method acting terribly wrong. wrong. Yeah, but I'm hoping. <laughs> but I'm hoping that was the take they used because Probably it was so. Probably a beautiful so... U87. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we need a backup <laughs> mic in there. Oh uh, uh, yeah, it's, I, yeah, some spectacular, uh, oh, spectacularly wow. expensive mic, and and then I was cleaning it up, and they're like, David, you don't, you don't have to do that, and I'm like, yeah, I really do, and and. Um, so you're uh, committed. Your performance is so authentic, I was, David. Uh, I, I love committed. that. Yeah, and then I do. So, and I also, um, I also play uh, King Shark on the Flash. Yeah, mm -hmm. and he's got this voice like this, and that, that's, and he has to growl and do all these oh, things. Yeah. And yeah. you know, he doesn't talk much, thank God. But uh, but the last episode I did, I did probably forty five minutes, and then my voice was shot. I couldn't Gone. speak mm -hmm. at all. For how long? Uh, it's about two days. Yeah. So, wow. so what then, do you do when that back. happens? You lose your voice. What do you do? I stop talking. <laughs> That's it. No. Yeah. No, I uh, mean, you know, look, I, I, I'm very fortunate in that I don't make my living off a of voiceover. I do it for fun, and and you know, it's a career that I I love, but I make my money writing, and so if I don't want to work, I don't work. I yeah. Mean, really. I, it's I, nice to yeah. have that option, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and typically, you know, I mean, you don't want to move a, a a booking or anything like that, but if you can't speak, they, they, the voiceover people are pretty yeah. Yeah. understandable. Very, very um, cool, man. So, yeah. true or false? False. <laughs> Moving on. Moving on. <laughs> and that's a pickup. So, uh, false <laughs> on <laughs> So, your first writing gig yes. was for an $80 million little tiny film for Fox. That's right. Um, <laughs> that's right. So, that would be a true... <laughs> Just a little low budget, that's a, eighty that's million true. dollar. That's true. That's true. Yeah. That was my very first writing job. Yeah, mm. yeah. Uh, it was a crazy um, situation wherein I had um, I had produced uh, and starred in a little film called Burn, um, which my friend Brian oh, Singer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. my friend Brian Singer had executive produced that with us, and um, and then, but it, we didn't get the movie sold. Um, I, I had been dating my acquisitions executive, which, if mm. I give any advice, so, <laughs> avoid avoid that um, <laughs> until they buy the movie. Anyway, yeah. um, in any case, uh, the point is is that <laughs> I was then I was a broke film producer, and my friend Brian was kind enough to give me a job answering the phones on the movie X Men. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know he he was worried about the script, and he's, he's always worried about this. He's always you know this is going to destroy my career or whatever. And I had been a big X Men fan. I knew the comic books very well, and so I suggested a scene to him, and he said, "Yeah, go write mm. that for me," uh, which I figured he was kidding, but he was not. 
Uh, and then he just started having me rewrite this script, which, you know, is how Brian Singer likes to work. He mm -hmm. typically has yeah. somebody with him who will just do rewrites right. all the time. Right. And, um, you know, so a lot of big writers don't want to do that, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, a, because they're not getting paid enough to just hang around on set all the time, and mm -hmm. B, because Brian will be yelling at them constantly. But if it's your first job, you're willing to put up with quite a yeah, bit. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. You know, if it's the chance of a lifetime. Was he yelling at you a lot? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, but also, I mean. Yeah, I, you know, and it really, you no, know, let me just be clear, because, <laughs> because Brian is, is uh, I owe my whole career to him, and I love him to death, and he's a very good friend. I, you know, and I always say he's a great friend. He's a little difficult to work for. But Most friends are, by the way. Yeah. As, so that's as, as friends yeah. are, yeah. Uh, and and well, but also he's a you know he's a brilliant, brilliant director, and he's ten steps ahead of everybody on the on the set. It's just right. like Jim Cameron. He's like, why aren't you catching up with me, sort of thing. And and so you know, yeah, it would be harsh at times, but it's just a part of his process. And I think you know, if I were to go back and do it now, it wouldn't affect me. Yeah. Um, you know, at the time I was a little sensitive about it, but yeah. Well, now, but now you I'm, have experience as a director, so you Well, now I yell at you people. Know, exactly. <laughs> but I mean, but the, the the writing role and then the directing, I mean, there's you can probably even better appreciate now having oh, totally. your own directing credits that what that encompasses and the stakes, the high stakes of that for absolutely. for someone. So, a absolutely. Yeah. And and uh, no, I you know I went back for more yelling, and yeah. you know the movie did well, and the second movie did even better, and yeah. so, so cool, man. It, was all, it was all worthwhile. Yeah, I was telling Stacy earlier that I've actually never met anybody who's written a huge freaking blockbuster like that. You ah, know? Well, now, I mean, now that, you have. You went, after you did that and you went and saw the movie, did you just feel amazing? I mean, yeah. you have yeah. to. It, well, it was, well, you know, the first one in particular because nobody thought that it would do well. Yeah, and, um, and nothing like was, that had been done. Yeah, everybody was very nervous about the studio, everybody, and um, so it was very surreal uh, seeing it and and, you know, all the people that have worked on blockbuster movies that you meet from now yeah. on will tell you, you know, Steven Spielberg can't look at Raiders Lost Ark and say, oh, what, what a perfect movie. He just looks and he's like, this he's, is horrible. Oh, wow, I can't believe we yeah. let that right, happen. Right, right. You know, yeah. it's just like everything you did, every, you can see the edges of the set in yeah. your mind. You can see all the takes it took to get to the model blowing up in just the right way. You know, you just, it's amazing. You can't appreciate it in the same way that other people appreciate it. Yeah. So, you know, I watched the first movie and I'm like, it's like a home movie that Brian and I made. <laughs> and I can see, yeah. um, and I can see there's a moment where, where Hugh Jackman hits the snow and I remember the snow had melted and so it's just potato flakes and like cushioning, you know, and you can see it <laughs> yeah. in, right, right. In, in the thing, but right. I can really see it. And oh, so, it's hysterical. So yeah, moment. it was, it was, um, it was something else. Well, the first time I saw it was here uh, at a press screening, uh -huh. so it wasn't a real audience. It was sort of industry people and press. Um, but, but a little anecdote about that: we we went, and I went with my friend Adam Duritz, who's a singer for Counting Crows, and there was a huge amount of people, and he didn't yeah. want to be out with everybody. So we walked to the front of the line, and just were wrapped on the window, and they came and opened the door and said yes, and said, "Look, I'm the writer of the movie. Will you?" can we get in early? And they were like, sure. So we go in, and the guy standing in the front of the line, who had to have been there for two hours, sort of a chubby guy, and he's wearing a Wolverine cap, and he goes, hey, why, why does he get to go in first? And my friend turns around all cocky, and he goes, well, he wrote the movie. And the guy goes, well, I created Wolverine. The, you know, doesn't that, isn't that worth anything? And I said, well, what's your name? And he said, Len Wein. Mm. And I was like, yeah, then you can come in with me. Yeah, you can. And so this was the guy, the comic book creator wow. who wow. created Wolverine was first in line for this weird press screening. So we all went in, watched the movie, and, you know, nobody, it's an industry crowd, so nobody really reacts. And I was like, I don't know. And I asked Len, and he was like, yeah, it's good. Yeah. Um, then I went to Toronto, and I saw it for the second time. And we're sitting, we're watching it. And it, the audience is dead silent. And... I turned to my friend and I was like, is everybody just bored to tears? And he goes, dude, they're not bored. And then the, they, he was like, yeah, they're really into it. And I'm like, I don't know. And then 
and then Wolverine's trailer hits that tree and he goes flying out through the windshield and yeah, yeah, flies, yeah, yeah. you know, 15 feet and lands on the thing. Yeah. And the whole audience just flipped out wow. and wow. started cheering and and I was like, and that was the moment where I was like, you know, I wanted mm-hmm. to cry. It was, I, I didn't because I don't have any feelings left, but um, <laughs> I've been in Hollywood for too long. But, uh, <laughs> Um, but had I had feelings, I'd have been yes. really moved. If you, <laughs> man. <laughs> well, it's a very wonderful, unique opportunity. You've had some really <laughs> amazing cool. yeah. opportunities. Absolutely. Um, well, hold on. I want to talk about two. Oh. That was one. Yeah. Let's talk okay. a little bit about We're two. About every because single every single thing. thing. Because okay. now you've been through it. Okay. Yeah. yeah and yeah. now here comes, and it was a success. Yeah. So here you go now with like. X Men Two. Right now it'll be yeah. easy, right? Now it'll be easy, right? Yeah. Got this. But no, uh, no. Then the, well, we started putting putting together X Men Two. It took six months to make the deal, make my deal, and it was just it was just a huge hassle and all this pressure. And I almost didn't do it. Yeah. And my and I t- called my agents and I was like, I, I think maybe I sh- just shouldn't do it. And they said, David, this movie is a guaranteed hit. Totally. You know how often you're going to get that in your career, that you're going to write a movie that you know is going to be a hit from second one? Yeah. I was like, you're right. And so, so we, we closed it, and, and, um, uh, and I worked on it for about a year. And then, uh, unfortunately, I had to go to Australia to work on another show uh, right when they went to shoot, so I wasn't on set for that one. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but that one, you know, I asked Brian... Uh, you know, the first movie is just all set up. It's all, here's what the X-Men are, here's why they have powers, right. here's why their names are so crazy, here's why we don't wear the yellow spandex, blah, yeah, blah, yeah. blah. Uh, I asked him on the second movie, I was like, do we have to set up all that stuff again? And he goes, no. Now we just assume everyone's seen the first movie and we just hit the ground running. And mm-hmm. and that's what we did. And so then, and then I wrote the um, the opening Nightcrawler attack on the White House. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, you know, sort of inspired by that feeling. We're just yeah. going to, literally hit yeah, the ground running yeah. and, and go. And so cool. So, yeah. so yeah, it, good. It really, um, I mean, you know, it it was a nicer experience in a lot of ways. I got paid a lot more. And of course. I got, uh, that's why you don't care if you do work now. <laughs> <'Cause> he, <laughs> that's right. He's like, yep, that's oh, exactly right, Chuck. I care. Yeah, so when you, I'm just <laughs> not going right. to do anything I don't want to do. You are not desperate. Yeah. No. And that is a very powerful place to be. It's a nice Absolutely. place to be. Absolutely. Um, nice place to be. No matter where you are in your career, not being desperate is a, beautiful, is a good, good thing. Absolutely. Yeah. When you think about it, I mean, you have such a diverse career. You've, you've been successful in so many different areas. When you think about it, how much of it do you think was luck, and how much do you think was strategy? That's, That's a, a really question. excellent question, and I don't think anybody's ever asked me that question. Um, you know, I always say that, I mean, taking that job, answering the phones on X-Men, and, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, and having Brian sort of decide to st- hand over the script to me, was the luckiest thing that ever happened of to course. me. I mean, frankly, happening to be on the list to come in and audition for Snake was incredibly lucky. And, you know, my friends always, my family, my friends always say, you know, you, you worked for it. And so it's like, yeah, I worked for it. But those two events are lightning in a bottle. And, you know, the only way that you can... Um, hope that that sort of thing is going to happen to you is to put yourself in the way of big productions and or you know put yourself in Hollywood or 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 New York or wherever you are but where the places where people are working and hope yeah. right. that somebody plucks you out of a crowd and mm-hmm. says you know you've got something special um so i credit luck to to a huge extent um but once brian started having me write the script and when we started, it was illegal. I wasn't, I didn't have a writing deal. Um, what I was doing was not legal. And uh, I then started to strategize very seriously about how I was going to survive this and then hopefully get some sort of credit, you know, or be able to translate that into, I, I was hoping that I'd get a job staffed on a TV show or something as a writer. Or, right, uh, right. Something Build like on that. that, yeah. So... Um, so once that luck hits, you want to make sure that you have some sense of strategy, that you have some sense of how the business works and, mm-hmm. and how you're going to manipulate events 
to to your greatest benefit. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's it's really uh, for me anyway. It was it was it was a real combination of of both. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, to say that I got hit by lightning and and became the writer of the X Men is half accurate. I got hit by lightning and then I did 13 months of just like, you know, in the work that I did, in the relationships I built with the studio, in the you know, surviving the power plays between the executives and, right, right. Yeah. you know, yeah. it was yeah. And the was fact that you, you got the opportunity, but you were able to step up to the plate yeah, and perform the task. Mm -hmm. Cause, that's that's cause, also cause very you, helpful. Because yeah. if yeah. you weren't able to do that, they would have been like, ah, yeah, never mind. Yeah, yeah no, totally. Go um, back to answering phones. Yeah, totally. And, and, um, and I would have... Well, that concludes part one with David Hayter. Very, very cool dude, so I'm cool. going to say. Yeah. We're going to be back next week with part two, so check it out. Yeah, make sure to join us then. And also keep up with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We love you guys. Thanks for watching. And just remember, you, you always, always have, have time, time for, for a little buzz. Leo Buzz Weekly is sponsored by Chuck Duran's Demos That Rock. Rock. The voiceover demo producer to the stars is now available to you. Visit DemosThatRock.com and take your voiceover career to the next level. See you next time. And remember, you always have time for a little buzz.